Okay, in this lecture, we will first continue a little bit with the kind of structures of radio galaxies and quasars which we met yes in, in the previous lecture and then look at some uh, particular aspects of these radio sources and later on we will move towards what is called a unified scheme of the diversity of active galaxies which we were introduced to in the, in the previous lecture. So, in this slide what you see is a relatively nearby radio galaxy in the Perseus cluster of galaxies. Galaxies as you have learnt are not isolated, they occur in groups of galaxies. Sometimes they are occur in very rich clusters of galaxies containing thousands of galaxies and these are part of the larger cosmic web of which we are all a part of. This particular galaxy you can see is not a linear structure, the kind of galaxies which we met in the earlier lecture with jets pointing in opposite directions, but having reasonably collinear structures. These are galaxies in clusters of galaxies, radio sources which where the parent galaxy is I could be moving around with velocities of hundreds of thousands of kilometers per second. This is in addition to their velocities due to the overall expansion of the universe. These are random velocities of galaxies which are in the clusters due to the gravitational potential in which they lie. As the galaxy moves around in the cluster, the beams of relativistic plasma which are squirting out from the active galactic nucleus can be bent backwards by ramp pressure and this is what you see over here and there are other possible explanations as well. They could be large galactic winds and interactions with companions. They all form the interesting shapes and structures that we see uh, in radio galaxies and quasars. I will just show you a couple of more examples of similar kind of structures. On the right what you see is a very interesting galaxy 3C75 with two nuclei, uh, but both of them, both the nuclei being radioactive. There are many galaxies with double nuclei, but it is not often that most of them, that both of them are radio sources. As we saw yesterday that less than about 10 percent of elliptical galaxies are luminous at radio frequencies and this is an, an interesting case of where both the nuclei are active and you can see the jets twirling around one each, each other interacting. And on the left we see what is called a head tail galaxy. Uh, where the, the galaxy is at the head and the entire radio plasma is bent backwards uh, perhaps by the ramp pressure of the, of the intercluster medium. So, the structures which you see are a product of both the motions of galaxies, dynamics in the galaxies as well as projection effects which can play a very important role. Another aspect of radio sources in clusters is that uh, they interact with the intercluster medium. Here what you see is another galaxy in the Perseus cluster 3C84. It is a very co-dominated radio galaxy, but when you observe it at high or low angular resolution, then you see the diffuse extended lobes of emission. If you look at it at high resolution, you will see the nuclear jets over here. This image, the contours show the radio image at low frequencies, the large scale structure and what you see in color, there is a pseudo color images of the X-ray emission. And what is obvious over there is that there is a clear anti-correlation between where the X-ray emission is and where the radio lobes are. So, the radio lobes have actually pushed out the radio emitting, the X-ray emitting plasma from there and the ambient temperatures in many of these regions are uh, of these, of these X-ray emitting regions are lower than the ambient temperature leading to cooling flows in clusters of galaxies. That is something you may have met. Uh, during the course of lectures on clusters of galaxies. Here our purpose is to concentrate on the nucleus and the active galactic nuclei, but you can see that manifestations of nuclear activity as ramifications not only in the host galaxy, but also in the intergalactic medium or the intergroup medium and on larger scales perhaps also on the inter, uh, intergalactic medium, not just the intercluster medium. Galaxies sometimes in addition to the bent structures which you see in clusters of galaxies may also have interesting shapes like this one which is referred to as an X shaped source. Now, when this is perhaps due to the precession of the jets, whether this is a smoking gun evidence for black holes which are going to coalesce in the near future is something which is often debated because precession can be induced when they are interacting with a companion until it stabilizes into a new sort of direction where the jets are squirting out of the nucleus. There are many such examples and, and these are interesting cases. Today, we know that galaxies, black holes can coalesce. We have evidence of it from 
uh, detection of gravitational waves, but radio emission or the radio structures provide some smoking gun evidence of interactions of black holes as well as how, how the radio structures might be affected through such interactions. So this is just a recap of the kind of structures we met yesterday during uh, the course of during, yes during the previous lecture. And the questions we are trying to ask ourselves today is that when you look at these huge lobes of radio emission, whether it be the ones you see in this slide or in clusters of galaxies, whatever may be the environment, what is the total energy content in these lobes? What is, how is the energy generated? And also how is it transported over distances which could extend to several megaparsecs in size or so? So here you see examples of both Fanerov-Riley class 2 galaxies and the Fanerov-Riley class 1 galaxies which you have already met. The class 2 galaxies are the high luminosity ones with hot spots at the outer edges and the Fanerov-Riley class 1 objects are the ones which are more symmetric jets. The jets are dissipative as they travel outwards and they end up in diffuse plumes of emission rather than depositing most of their energy in the bright hot spots at the outer edges. Now to estimate the total energy content in these sources, we have to go back to the basic theory of how is the emission generated. As we learnt, the radio emission which you see is due to synchrotron emission where high relativistic particles are moving in a magnetic field. And suppose we consider relativistic electrons with an energy density Ue and a it moves in a magnetic field whose energy density is given by b squared upon 8 pi. Going back to basic synchrotron theory, you will find that for a source of luminosity L, the total energy content is luminosity multiplied by b to the power of minus 3 by 2. What you have over here is that the stronger the magnetic field, the high energy electrons are going to lose energy faster. But the, the lobes of radio plasma which you see may not, will not be made up just of electrons, it could also consist of heavier particles, protons, ions and so there is a factor k over there, a fudge factor to take care of heavier particles as well. And the energy in relativistic particles and magnetic fields is nothing but the sum of the two and V is the volume of the radio lobe. Now when you look at this diagram of how the total energy varies as a function of B, you will find that when you look at the radio luminosity, it varies as B to the power of minus 3 by 2 and when you look at magnetic field, it goes as B squared. So and there is a minimum over there, that minimum will scale a little bit depending upon the value of K, but the minimum lies when there is rough equipartition between the energy density in particles and the magnetic energy density. And one can use this to try and estimate what is the total energy in the lobes of radio emission. So the total, if you look at the typical source Cygnus A, which we have met several times, at a, this is at a redshift of 0 0.0561, at a distance of 250 megaparsec, it's about 140 kiloparsecs in size. And the total radio luminosity which we want to calculate, usually we take a range over which uh, we detect radio emission. This is from 10 megahertz to about 10 to the power of 11 hertz, you can see 100 gigahertz. And this could exceed the entire bolometric luminosity of galaxies. And this is energy which is originates in the nucleus of the parent optical object and is shifted outwards to form these extended lobes of emission. If one does the sums, then you will find that the magnetic field is on the order of 10 to the power of minus 5 to 10 to the power of minus 4 Gauss and the minimum energy is in the range of 10 to the power of 60 to 61 ergs or so. In more luminous sources, it could be even larger. And you can see that when you look at 10 to the power of minus 5 Gauss, it is about 10 micro Gauss. So if you take an electron of 3 GeV energy uh, radiating in a field of 10 micro Gauss, then the emission which you will see is would be at around 20 centimeters or so, 1500 megahertz or so. And this will last about um, maybe 30 million years would be the lifetime of that electron. If the fields were stronger, lifetime would be shorter. If the electrons were more energetic as well, the lifetimes would be shorter. So this is the kind of energy which is being generated in the nuclear galaxy which accumulates over the lifetime of the source forming these huge lobes of emission which whose separations can range up to several megaparsec in size. Now we want to try and understand how is this energy generated? What is the source of this energy? 
There were a lot of debate as to how this might be originated. So instead of going into a historical background, what I will try to illustrate over here is the broadly accepted scenario of how energy is generated in the nuclear regions of these active galactic nuclei. Suppose we consider matter falling from infinity onto an object of mass m and radius r and as it falls it requires kinetic energy as potential energy becomes more negative and if you were to consider a proton of mass mp falling from infinity you can write down the kinetic energy equal to the potential energy over there and when it reaches the surface of the star it rapidly dis decelerates it will obviously stop kinetic energy uh, of free fall will be radiated away as heat and which is seen as X-ray emission in, in, in stellar sources. Now we will come into uh, active galactic nuclei in a short while, but if you look at the rate at which energy is generated, one can relate it to the rate at which mass is being accreted. So if I write the luminosity as L is equal to half dm dt, the rate at which mass is, um, is accreted into the velocity of free fall squared and you can put that potential energy over there and get an expression for V free fall squared in terms of 2 gm by r and one can write down this expression in terms of the Schwarzschild radius which is rg equal to 2 gm upon c squared. Then using the simple expression you can get an expression for the luminosity which is generated which is L, the luminosity L is equal to half rate at which mass is being accreted dm dt c squared rg upon r. Rg is the Schwarzschild radius and R is the radius of the object which is accreting matter. So that is the expression which you see over here and half Rg upon R is a measure of the efficiency of conversion of the accreted matter into heat and depends on how compact a star is. You can see that if for a similar, for if R is small, L is going to be large. Now if you take a white dwarf star about a solar mass and a radius of about 5 into 10 to the power of 6 meters, then you find the efficiency half rg upon r to be 3 into 10 to the power of minus 4. Whereas if you take a neutron star which is much more compact, is usually about 10 to 15 kilometers, then you find the efficiency going up to about 0.1. So accretion into a neutron star is a very powerful source of energy. If you were to look at how this compares with uh, the interiors of stars, for example, like our sun, where energy is generated by nuclear fusion or proton-proton interactions, being proton-proton interactions being the dominant one, chain being the dominant one, then it is a, about 7 into 10 to the power of minus 3. So you can see that a neutron star, a compact object as massive as our sun, has an efficiency which is much higher. Now what do we do with black hole? Black hole are compact objects, even more compact, it is a singularity effectively and we, could, we should be able to do much better. Of course, in a black hole, what do we take as a surface? If for example, matter is falling directly into the black hole, it will just go away, it will get inside the black hole and we will not going to get radiation out of it. Usually what happens is that in practice, in falling matter has a certain angular momentum and this angular momentum, because of it, matter can fall into the black hole and forms a disk. And this kind of structure forms because orthogonal to the axis of rotation, the matter collapses where centrifugal forces will lead to the formation of a disk or disk like structure. And then matter can fall or spiral slowly into the black hole as it loses angular momentum. And the physics of it is very interesting, achieved by viscous forces. Viscosity helps to redistribute the angular momentum and some of the matter spreads outwards taking angular momentum with it, allowing rest of the material to fall spiral inwards. Viscosity acts as a frictional force which results in the dissipation of heat. And this is how you find that um, the, the accretion disks around both stars as well as massive objects are powerful sources of emission, particularly at high energies. If you look at the efficiency of conversion, then you find that if you had a Schwarzschild black hole, it is about 0.06. And for a maximally rotating curved black hole, it actually goes up to about 0 0.4 to 6. So this is one of the most efficient ways of trying to generate the huge amounts of energy that we see in these active galactic nuclei. And this is the current sort of widely accepted scenario for the generation of this energy. A little bit more on 
on, on the accretion process. Now we saw that the, the luminosity which you generate is proportional to the rate at which mass is being accreted, dm dt. So you can ask yourself that could you generate an arbitrary large luminosity by increasing the accretion rate, keep increasing the accretion rate and get higher and higher luminosities? The answer is no. The answer is there is a limit to the luminosity which you can reach and that is because if the luminosity is too great, then the radiation which is generated itself will try to blow away the infalling material. So you have to, this is happens because the material which is falling it is usually ionized and the ionized, uh, the radiation which is going outwards will scatter with the electrons by Thomson scattering and the plasma is overall neutral, the electrons will be, co will be coupled to the protons and it is the balance of this inward force of gravity and the outward pressure due to radiation that will set a limiting luminosity which was worked out by Eddington and is referred to as Eddington luminosity. You can see the expression over there which is the Le, the Eddington luminosity is given by 4 pi gravitation constant, mass of the object, mass of the proton, velocity of light divided by Thomson scattering cross section. What you notice over here that all of them are physical constants except the mass of the object. Okay? And if you were to put it in, uh, in sort of terms which in numbers which you can easily comprehend, it will work out to 1.3 into 10 to the power of 31 m upon m sun watts and it generates into 1.3 to the power of 38 m upon m sun, m sun is the mass of our sun, ergs per second. So you can see that when you see stellar systems and look at the luminosities which you see at high energies, particularly at X-ray energies, that the luminosities are within or very close to the Eddington luminosity. And if you look at this number again, you will find that um, that in the case of black holes or supermassive black holes, in the case of AGN, you need massive black holes of 10. For example, if you want to generate 10 to the 46 ergs per second numbers which we met when we looked at the luminosities of this object, you will need a massive object of about 10 to the power of 8 solar masses or so. So a scenario of the kind of luminosities which you see and the expression for the Eddington luminosity seems to match up. And when you look at how much material you need to accrete to kind of generate the luminosities, it is not unusually large, it is about 2 solar masses per year. Now as I said, heat is being generated in this accretion disk and you can see that the hottest and brightest material would be near the innermost stable orbit. Defining R is 3 times the Schwarzschild radius, you can assume using the Stefan Boltzmann law equated to the Eddington luminosity and you can get an expression for the temperature. Now if you look at that expression and you put a solar mass object over there, you will get neutron stars of about 10 to the power of 7 k or so accreting matter from a companion. And this is the kind of emission which you will see at the X-ray wavelengths consistent with the observations. For supermassive objects, you can see that when you go to larger, more massive objects, your Rg is going to be larger your t and R is equal to 3 times Rg. So you are actually getting energy out at larger distances for more massive objects. And if you look at this expression which is inversely m comes to the bottom over here right now to the power of 1 by 4, you will get a temperature of about 10 to the power of 5 Kelvin which is occurs in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. And if you recollect the spectral energy distribution of quasars or active galaxies which we saw earlier, then you will find that there was a bump in the spectral energy distributions. So that is something which we can understand in terms of thermal emission from, the accretion, from a hot accretion disk with a supermassive black hole accreting material from its surroundings. So accretion onto a supermassive black hole provides a viable explanation of trying to understand the huge energy output of active galactic nuclei. Now the question is that that is all fine, but in astronomy or in, or in science, we always want additional evidences for it and we have to ask ourselves, is this really true? Can we find evidences of black holes in the central regions of these active galaxies? So you'll be you have been introduced to some observational evidences of existence of black holes in the nuclei of galaxies. So I will be brief, but I will just show you one or two examples of how detections or inference or measurements of masses of black holes in the centers of AGN. 
Before I do that, I would also like to mention that I have just given you a very broad brush scenario of accretion being a viable process to generate the large amount of energy which we see from the nuclear regions of active galaxies. But the details are some of the challenges which we need to understand in further greater detail. For example, if we look at radio galaxies itself, based on the spectra and the excitation of the lines, these have also been broadly classified into the high excitation radio galaxies and the low excitation radio galaxies. And sources with high excitation, high, high excitation radio galaxies or the HERGs are believed to be sources with higher accretion rates. They have younger stellar population. They have central black hole masses which are still growing and they have high central star formation rates. They are believed to have geometrically thin and optically thick accretion disks similar to the ones which Shakura and Sunai have worked on. Whereas the scenario is different for the low excitation radio galaxies. Here you have lower excitation rate, we have high stellar masses, we have higher black hole masses and the stellar population is actually older. So trying to connect up the physics of the accretion, the kind of accretion processes that may be taking place in the central regions could differ for different kinds of active galaxies and that is an interesting and very challenging area of study as well. And we still have not touched on the spin of the black hole. So that is another aspect which will play a crucial role in terms of what we see in the active galactic nuclei. So briefly, just to sort of introduce you to the observational evidence of black holes, just as if you had a massive object, it will affect the motion of gas, stars, particles, spots, whatever in its vicinity. We mentioned earlier that the broad emission lines could be due to the line emitting clouds which are moving around with high velocities due to a massive, supermassive black hole in the center. But can we go do a little better than that? Here what we see is NGC 4261, a radio galaxy in the Virgo cluster of galaxies and a high resolution HST, the Hubble Space Telescope image shows a structure which is reminiscent of an accretion disk with a supermassive black hole at the center. So this is the kind of circumstantial evidence of the black hole of a central engine that perhaps we are actually moving in the right direction. This is a Seaford galaxy, NGC 4258 at a distance of about 23 million years or so. And yet what we see is not just the optical image visible in infrared which is shown in yellow and reddish colors, but we also see an X-ray and radio emission from this object and the X-ray is pro probably shock heated, ionized, shock heated gas. Now right in the central region of this object is the, is the active galaxy and there is, and when you take a spectrum of this object at millimeter wavelengths, you find that it has strong, very strong water vapor emission. Now when you take a spectrum with poor resolution, you can't really know where those individual spots are coming from. So to do that, you need to connect and make images of the source with very long baseline interferometry techniques, which will give you uh, resolutions at the, at the level of milliard seconds or so. And when you do that, actually each velocity component in the spectrum would correspond to a certain velocity and hence a certain frequency and you can fine tune your equipment or your telescope to make observations at each of these spots and try and reconstruct where they lie and how it might be moving. And when you do that, what you find is a beautiful, uh, sorry, beautiful disk in which the material, in which these major spots lie and in the middle what you see is a jet like structure which is orthogonal to this somewhat warped disk and when you look at the motions the velocities with which these spots are moving, then you find that the motion can be described entirely as Keplerian and once you do that, you can go and find out what the mass of the central object is and it is about 3.9 into 10 to the power of 7 or 40 million solar masses right in the nucleus of this active galaxy. So this is one, this is one way or direct way of trying to estimate masses of these objects. Then I will give you one or two other examples. This is M87 which we have met again and again from the dynamics of the gas right in the central region. Again, this is HST observations because you really need high resolution to be able to look deeply into the nuclear regions of these galaxies. If your resolution is poor, everything will be smudged. And Doppler shift measurements of the gas in the central region show that 
There's a component which is coming towards you, which is blue shifted. There's a component which is going away from you, which is red shifted. And model fits, the estimates have varied a little bit over the years, but one of the more recent measurements put it as 3.5 billion solar masses, 3.5 into 10 to the power of 9 solar masses. So NGC 4258, which we had met earlier, would be a radio quiet or a radio weak galaxy associated with a Seifert, a spiral galaxy. And this is a, an elliptical galaxy with a greater bulge it's, it's a, compared to a spiral galaxy. And it is one of the giant ellipticals, one of the first radio sources to be identified when radio galaxies were, when radio galaxies were initially discovered. This is just an illustration of the relation that these black hole masses seem to be closely related to the bulge. I will not get too much into it because this is really in the realm of how galaxies themselves evolve, but it is worth noting that the way the black, black holes masses evolve with time is intimately related to the growth of the bulge and hence the evolution of galaxies themselves. And this seems to be intimately related to the way the AGNs or active galactic nuclei and the luminosities that form. So this was sort of a brief overview so far of um, the, generation of the generation of the huge luminosity by accretion onto supermassive black holes and some of the observational evidences to suggest how, uh, suggest the, the possibility or the viability of such a scenario. We will now take a look at another theme in active galactic nuclei which is jets. Initially let us look at radio wavelengths. This is a giant radio galaxy, NGC 6251. And, and a giant radio galaxy is defined to be one in today's cosmology. Um, it is of has a projected linear size of at least 700 kiloparsec. And what you can see over there is on different scales that the radio jet has been ma mapped right from very low resolution where the entire structure is seen to looking at the jet and at, right at the bottom what you see is the VLBI scale jet. Now what you notice over here is the jets roughly point in the same direction so that in, in this particular object and this is not always true you will notice when you look at co-dominated sources which you look at it a little uh, later but in most of the radio galaxies you will find that the, 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 jet, the jet on all scales right from you know hundreds of kiloparsecs to parsec scale jets when they occur in the same object are roughly in the same direction. You can also notice over here that the jet is one-sided and there is very little or there is hardly any counter jet which is visible in this image. Now there are a lot of questions you can ask about jets. What does it consist of? What is the strength of the magnetic field? How fast is it moving? What is the energy density? So we will not address all aspects of it, but let us just look at one aspect of it now. How fast are the jets moving? How do we measure how fast a jet is moving? Now when you look at the large scale jets, to measure motion what we need to do, we need to measure a compact spot and try and follow its motion with time. Because once you have a distance and you have a time, you can divide one by the other and get a velocity. The problem with the large scale jets is that when you, these motions are so small because the objects are located so far away that when you look at it with the kind of resolutions which are required, the large scale jets do not have any compact structures. They get completely resolved out with VLBI scale resolutions, which is which are at the level of milli arc seconds or so. This is the nucleus jet of the first quasar which is identified, 3C273. You have seen the radio structure earlier. This is, if you looked at the radio jet, radio nucleus which you saw earlier with milli arc second resolution, this is what you are going to see. The bright spot is the radio core. If you probe even higher with higher resolution in the radio core, you will again see an unresolved base of the jet and unresolved core which is unresolved base of the jet and a jet on even smaller scales. But what you see over there are knots or peaks of emission. These could be individual plasmons or it could be shocks in the flow of the jet. But once we have such features and we can image it, we can see how it varies with time and see its motion. And, and understand the physics of why it varies and also understand what estimate what its velocity could be. The radio emission here again is all synchrotron emission and, and synchrotron emission as we learned earlier is polarized 
and you will detect polarization from the knots in these jets as well. The cores, because they are very compact, tend to be much less polarized, but if you observe them with higher and higher resolution, even from the smaller scale nuclear jets, you will begin to see polarized emission. Polarization percentages vary, if the fields are very tangled up, the degree of polarization will be less, but the shocks and the flow of the jet tend to drag the field lines along and sometimes you can also get tens of percent polarization in, in these small scale jets as well. In the larger scale jets, it could, it could be even larger. Now, this is what I was trying to tell you that you can see in both the images over here that when you look at the images, a time, it is a time sequence over here of two different quasars. One on the left is 3C273, the one on the right is 3T279. And when you estimate the velocity, the amazing thing is that you have measured the distance, you have measured the time over which you have made the measurements and you get a velocity which is much greater than the velocity of light. So, this was termed a superluminal motion. Initially, there were doubts, but today we not only we understand it in terms of very basic physics, but it is something which is widely seen in a whole range of active galaxies. You will also see over here, this is the, this is the jet in M87 uh, observed with the HST where one of the inner knots in the jet also show evidence of superluminal motion. There are also knots over here which move at subluminal speeds. At this stage, we will also show you a couple of short films, uh, videos, short films on how, um, the jet, how the intensities in these knots could vary, which uh, raises a lot of interesting questions on shocks in the flow of the jet and how do, and what the physical processes which might be playing a role and also the motion of knots in the jet which gives rise to the kind of motion, the kind of picture which you saw earlier. And these knots actually vary with time both in total intensity and linear polarization as you can see from these short video clips. Now, let us try to understand why, why, why do we superluminal motion? What is it that is so critical that enables us to see measure velocities which are greater than that of light, but yet it does not violate special relativity at all or any of basic physics. Now, to just to understand that, just consider this uh, sketch on the right hand side. Uh, what you see at the top is the nucleus of the galaxy and a plasmon which is a bit of squiggly contours over there it is moving out with a velocity v t at an angle, at a small angle to the line of sight towards you. Now, if this plasmon, consider a wave front which is emitted when it was at the origin and, and consider a wave front which it emits when it is at the current location. The wave front which is emitted when it was at the origin is shown by the dotted parallel line over there. What you see over here is that if the plasmon actually had moved at the velocity of light itself, it would have kept up with the wave front. But it is a reasonably high fraction of the velocity of light that this plasmon when it emits the second wave front at the location it is now, that the time which you measure is going to be squashed. So, you have a distance measurement and all the distance measurement we make in astronomy are of, of sizes of objects are projected onto the plane of the sky. So, what we are going to measure as the size of this object is v t sin phi, where phi is the angle of inclination of the source axis of the jet to the line of sight. So, that is the distance you will measure and then you divide by the time. The time would be just the difference in the arrival of the two wave fronts and if you do a little algebra, you will come at that expression which is written over there that beta apparent which is v equal to beta c is uh, v by c is beta over there, the apparent velocity is beta sin phi divided by 1 minus beta cosine phi. Physically what is happening is that the time which you measure between the two have been squashed and giving rise to an apparent velocity which is greater than that of light. If the plasmon is moving at 0.99 c at an angle of 5 degrees to the line of sight, you will get a beta apparent which is 6 times the velocity of light. Now, when this plasmon is moving towards you, 
its flux density will also be enhanced because you will have to make the relativistic transformations of the solid angle over which you are measuring flux density, there will also be transformations of time, frequency and, and also a frequency would mean that your observed frequency will be diff different from the frequency at which it was emitted and if you put in those you will get an expression which is written at the bottom right hand corner which is S observed is equal to S intrinsic divided by gamma into 1 minus beta cosine phi to the power of n plus alpha. Alpha is the spectral index which is typically about 0.6 to 1. Gamma is not the Lorentz factor of the individual electron but gamma is the bulk Lorentz factor of the jet itself beta is the velocity at which the jet is moving and you can find that the intense observed intensity can be enhanced by large amount as well. And so we have an increase in intensity and we also have a viable explanation for superluminal motion. Now what I showed is minus over there that if the jet is going away from you, your jet, your intensity is going to diminish. If it is coming towards you, the sign is minus, if it is going away from you, the sign is plus. And you can also see over here that if phi is 90 degrees that it is going in the sky plane, you still see a, diminish, a, di a diminishing of the observed flux density because it will be gamma to the power of n plus alpha where n is 2 or 3 depending upon the model you invoke and is usually taken to be 2 for jets and 3 for individual plasmons uh, which are, which are travelling towards you. Then, then there is a reduction due to the transverse Doppler effect. Now if you look at jets, we saw that many of these jets, superluminal jets are completely asymmetric and that is also true of the large scale jets we saw in quasars. Now if the jets are intrinsically symmetric, say if there is a jet going out in the opposite direction as well, then what you will find is that you look at the observed flux density ratio of the approaching and receding jets and that will be given by 1 plus beta cosine phi divided by 1 minus beta cosine phi to the power of n plus alpha. So V is of the order of C close to it, phi is 20 degrees, you can see that you can get flux density ratios of the order of several thousands. So this not only provides an explanation of superluminal motion, but it also provides an explanation of, uh, of the asymmetry of the jets which you observe on the large scales. You remember that the Fanner of Riley class 1 jets, the low luminosity jets are more symmetric. That would, could happen if the angle is large and the velocities are small. Whereas if the angles are small and the velocities are large, you will get more asymmetric jets. Now can we test this further? Can we test this further? You see that in you, you always want additional evidence to see that hey your scenario may be consistent but can we predict something new or different which will lead ad additional credibility to the model that we are trying to propose or support. This is this was an interesting a very cute experiment which was done by uh, Robert Lang and Simon Garrington uh, who was then a PhD student at Jodrell Bank and what they said was that if the jet is on the receding side then all the plasma will have to go through the magnetic ionic medium of the host galaxy. Whereas for the jet which is approaching you, most of the material would be actually behind it. So it will not go through the entire path length of the magneto ionic medium of the host galaxy. What happens if polarized signal is going through the uh, magneto ionic medium which is a magnetic field and ionized plasma is that the E vector would be rotated. The amount of rotation is given by this expression and the terms within the integral is a measure of what is called the rotation measure. Now the magnetoionic medium is not going to be a simple one density medium uniform, it is going to be a turbulent medium with different scale sizes of irregularities, different magnetic fields so that when you average it up particularly at long wavelength you can see that a change in wave, change in angle is proportional to the square of the wavelength that your polarization is going to drop. So if I were to make measurements at longer wavelengths at 20 centimeters which corresponds to 1400 megahertz compared to 6 centimeters which is 5 gigahertz then at 20 centimeters I will get a lower degree of polarization. Do we see that? Let us have a look at one such object. Here is the quasar 3C47 and 3C47 you can see a one sided jet and what you see over here on the left the, 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 the porcupine like vectors over there, they are the vectors of polarization, it, the, the length indicates the level of polarization. The one on the left is a, 
is at the higher frequency and one on the right is at the longer wavelength. All right? And along the wavelength you can see the one which is on the non-jetted side which should be going away from you where the plasma should be going through the magnetoionic medium of the host galaxy, you can detect hardly any polarization at all. You can plot that as a function of what is called a depolarization parameter and you can see dp that is a degree of polarization at 20 centimeters divided by the degree of polarization at 6 centimeters. The one on the jet side there is hardly any depolarization, the one on the opposite side is completely depolarized by, by traversing through the magnetoionic medium of the host galaxy associated with the quasar. If you recall yesterday, we showed from HST observations that quasars are nothing but the luminous nuclei of host, a uh, nuclei of host galaxies, which in this case are perhaps largely elliptical galaxies. So, we have an explanation for now, uh, jet asymmetry. We now have also an explanation for superluminal motion in terms of jets squirting out from the active nucleus at velocities which are very close to that of light. Briefly, we will also have a look at jets are not unique to radio wavelengths. You can see them at optical wavelengths, you can see, see them, image them very clearly at X-ray wavelengths. This has particularly become possible with the Hubble Space Telescope and then with the Chandra Telescope at X-ray wavelengths. And here is a, the nuclear jet of M87. M87 is a galaxy which you keep meeting again and again and jets over here are seen at X-ray radio and optical wavelengths and the bright spot at the extreme left is the nucleus. Here if you look at the spectral energy distribution right from radio to X-rays, you find that they can be reasonably well explained as being due to synchrotron radiation. But this is not always the case, for example, if you look at the quasar over here, which is also uh, where we also have shown the images at at X-ray optical and radio that you will find that the spectrum at higher energies at X-ray is harder and perhaps the synchro cell Compton or inverse Compton scattering uh, is playing an important role and the current flavor I think is uh, favorite model is that inverse Compton scattering with the cosmic microwave background photons is the most is the most favored explanation for some of the jets um, at high frequencies in the quasars. Now, let us recap what we have seen. We have seen that the radio cores the, have flat spectra and when you move and you image them with high resolution, you resolve them into nuclear jets and in, and, and in sources where the cores are very strong, you see superluminal motion and this can be understood when the jets are inclined at small angles to the line of sight. The small angle leads to the boosting of the flux density to the core due to the relativistic effects. So, the ones where you see strong, uh, super, uh, super, where you see superluminal motion are also the sources where you have strong cores which are where the jets are inclined at small angles. Nuclear jets we see need moves, needs to move close to the velocity of light to understand superluminal motion. These jets could be slowing down as they move outwards. And, and, and the velocities could be, you know, a small fraction of the velocity of light as they plow through the, uh, initially through the host galaxies interstellar medium and then through the external medium whether it be the intercluster or the intergroup medium. We also see that the flux density of the approaching jet is Doppler boosted, the receding one is Doppler diminished and <clears throat> the, also the superluminal sources tend to have not only more prominent cores, but they are also often variable. So, putting all this together, can we try and see if we can understand the diversity of galaxies in terms of inclination and superluminal motion. Just to recap over here, on the left I show an image of 3C452 which is a radio galaxy and you can see the, the core over here is hardly visible, uh, it, is a very, it has a very weak core and the spectrum because it is largely dominated by the extended emission is steep. Um, non-thermal emission, whereas on the right what you see is a core dominated radio source, on the left is a Merlin image of it, on the right it has, it is zooms into the, uh, into the dominant component which you see, as I mentioned earlier, if you keep looking at it higher and higher resolution, you again see a core which is the unresolved base of the jet and a jet at smaller and smaller scales. But these, these emissions on small scales are absorbed either due to synchrotron self-absorption or even thermal gas can absorb this emission giving rise to very complex or flat spectra. Now, the question is the superluminal motion which you can see in jets 
like 3C454.3 and also the asymmetry of the jet can be understood if these sources are inclined at small angles to the line of sight. But we are not in very specific location on the universe. The universe do not care where we are and or how we look, but, but they are randomly distributed in the sky. So, there should be objects which are the same 3C454.3, if it is inclined at a larger angle to the line of sight, what would it look like? Would it look like 3C452? Because the core is going to be diminished, the outer lows may become more visible. Right now, your dynamic range limited as well. 3C454.3 has incidentally been observed to a very high dynamic range. It does not seem to have the same kind of extended emission, but many of the other sources are, do, have, do show evidence of extended emission. Now, if we can show that, then we what are we saying? We are saying that these apparently two different kinds of objects are actually the same, but they are only appearing to be different to you because they are inclined at different angles to the line of sight. So, this is the essence of the unified scheme for active galaxies. Unified schemes, we have focused on radio loud objects, which are co dominated radio sources, complex spectra, superluminal motion, and these are also strongly variable, and these are the ones which are often associated with quasars. Whereas at large angles, they will be associated, they would have weak cores, more symmetric jets, or weak jets, and non detectional superluminal motion, and these are by larger radio galaxies. What you also saw was that the quasars, if you remember and recall the properties, had broad emission lines. Whereas, although a small fraction of radio galaxies are broad line radio galaxies, but by and large they are characterized by narrow emission lines. So, we, if the unified scheme is to be correct, then we also need to be able to explain properties not at just radio wavelengths. We cannot be chauvinist at any particular frequency, we have to understand it across the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, look at the broad emission lines. So, we have to hide them. How do we hide them? So, one possible solution is that there is a torus of material which surrounds the broad line region, and the broad line region, and when you are seeing it at a small angle to the line of sight, you are seeing the object through the torus, and the torus is so thick that you are not being able to see the broad lines at all. Whereas, when you see have a direct view of the nucleus, when the jet is at a small angle, the radio loud QSOs as they are called, then you get a view of the broad line region. Fine. So, that provides a viable explanation of, a, of, of trying to account for the optical spectral differences as well between radio galaxies and quasars. In this scheme, quasars would be inclined at small angles and radio galaxies at larger angles. Although we had earlier looked at differences in orientation between, uh, between lobe dominated and core dominated quasars, this was put together by Peter Bartel, putting in galaxies in a similar framework as well. So, objects which do not differ in their orientation, for example, the huge lobes of emission should ideally be similar. Now, what about the optical spectra? This is what we just discussed that broadline region is directly visible and the broadline region occur closer to the, to the supermassive black hole. Now, we need to establish two things that the broadline region is indeed close to the supermassive black hole and that, that there is some evidence for a torus. Otherwise, how do we actually take this with any degree of seriousness at all? So, let us try and find out how do you find out where the broad lines are. When you take a spectrum, you do not usually have the resolution to say, hey, that is my broad line emitting cloud. It occurs very close to the central region and, and even space based telescopes at 50 milli arc seconds, you cannot really sort of say, hey, this is my broad line region. So, there we actually take recourse to two things. Now, first let me show you evidences for ionization cones. This is NGC 5728 Seaford galaxy, a spiral galaxy and when you look at right in the central region, you can see the hard photons which are coming out from the nucleus are not illuminating the entire 4, four pi sphere, 4 pi radians. What you see is that the radiation is coming out in the form of cones. The cones are not always symmetric because some of it will be affected by absorption within depending on the inclination of the galaxy, absorption within the galaxy itself. But you can see that hey, there they must, there could be something like a torus sitting over there. It is because a torus like structure could be there that one can understand the emission line cones that one sees in a galaxy. This is sure that this galaxy is not just the only one that you keep seeing these cones in other sort of AGN as well. These are sort of two more examples again HST observations and 
It is an ESO identified galaxy and a Markarian 573. And, and, the, and, the, and it's worth mentioning that the orientation of these cones has no relationship to the orientation of the galaxy. It does not necessarily have to be along the minor axis as such, but the axis of the jet is closely related to the ionization direction of the ionization cones. This is a structure of a, C, the, a very well known Seaford galaxy where you see structures at different scales. Um, the green one is molecular gas around what we believe is a torus and then you can see the jet which is uh, orthogonal to it which is squirting out from the active nucleus. So, such structures are also seen in uh, are also seen in uh, in um, uh, radio galaxies, but they are much more clearly seen in this more nearby sort of Seaford galaxies they can be measured observed with far greater resolution as well. So, so far we have looked at the unified schemes for radio galaxies and quasars. We have not looked at uh, other forms of unified schemes like uh, the uh, BL lags and uh, so, but the idea is to just to give you a glimpse of what is possible rather than be exhaustive. But I must mention that, um, that just like the radio galaxies and quasars are radio loud objects, the large scale structure are FR2 class objects and you cannot change an FR2 and FR1 by orientation. So, things which are only orientation independent must continue to appear similar in the objects which are inclined at different angles to the line of sight. Then we show you evidence of the ionization cones in nearby Seaford galaxies. But then this similar explanation must also hold for Seaford galaxies. We saw two kinds of Seafords largely, they are intermediate types as well because sources are inclined at all kinds of angles. And in Seaford 1s we see the broad line region as well as the narrow line region, whereas Seaford 2 we only see the narrow line region. So, in this case also what we have to say is that in C foot 1 galaxies we are taking we are getting a direct view of the nucleus whereas in C foot 1 galaxies we are getting a direct view of the nucleus whereas in C foot 2 galaxies the nuclear broadline region is again obscured by the torus whose evidence we saw in a few of the galaxies a little while earlier. So, the torus picture is perhaps ok although we still got to understand wh what how the torus is constituted what leads to the leads to a torus being there at all in the central region. Is it a form of a disk, a continuation of the disk or winds from the disk which lead to such structures? The other aspect is to say that okay, the broad line region we say are hidden by the torus. We also need to be able to say that how close the broad line region are to the supermassive black hole. Given the large velocity widths, one believes that they are close, but can we measure it? So, after showing you one more example of uh, a Seaford galaxy with an ionization cone and a radio jet and a structure which has been seen with high, at, uh, with high resolution orthogonal to the jet which you see in the upper right, one believes, one suggests has suggested that this may be also due to the signs of the disk or torus. But now let us move on to, <coughs> move on to uh, trying to see if this scenario can also provide an explanation as to for Seaford 2 and Seaford 1 galaxies. Now, in this case, a very interesting experiment was done by Ski Antonucci, Miller, and done for many other galaxies later is to say that hey, if there is a Seaford 1 nucleus in what appears to us to be a Seaford 2 galaxy, can I try and see some way if there is a Seaford 1 nucleus? And they thought of a very clever experiment of this particular galaxy NGC 10, 1068, which is a classic Seifert 2 galaxy that was the that is the identification based on the spectrum. And it has an ionization cone as well. And what they tried to do was something extremely interesting is that they said, well, if for example, there is a Seifert 1 nucleus, one possibility is that can that be reflected into our view? There are clouds of electrons and dust um, in these in these in these regions in the nu circumnuclear region over there, and if it is fortuitously located, for example, would that would the broad emission line region be reflected to a line of sight? Now, and that is what is indeed they found. They found from spectropolarimetric observations that light that scattered light from the nucleus is indeed what they could detect. Now, what is the signature that 
that uh, this light is indeed scattered light from the nucleus is that these emission lines are thermal processes and they would not be polarized. But by reflection you could polarize the light and then and these are broad sort of Bama lines which you, you would not expect such lines to be so far away from the nucleus. So, th this was one of the very strong evidence to suggest that indeed there must be a Seifert 1 nucleus hidden in the Seifert 2. So, there has been a fair degree of success in terms of these unified schemes for active galaxies. Here is a, just a cartoon to illustrate that where how you might be able to see a Seifert 1 nucleus in a Seifert 2 galaxy. And Although there are issues which we still need to work on, the broad scenario of the unification scheme for AGN is something which is broadly accepted. This particular uh, sketch just summarizes that, but there are also challenges which you need to understand. And before we go further, let me just try to answer the question which I posed a little while earlier that we also need to determine the distance of the broadline region from the central nuclear source. And that, is, and that is where we come to the concept of reverberation mapping which was introduced to you earlier. So, I will just sort of very briefly go through it. That the emission lines which you see are due to ionization and recombination. The ionization is by the photons which come from the effectively the nucleus of the center of the galaxy which is due to accretion into onto the supermassive black hole thus essentially from the center. So, if there are variations in the continuum spectrum then obviously, your lines are also, also going to respond to it, but how soon will they respond? How soon would they respond will depend on how far they are from the nucleus. If they are very close to it, they will respond faster. If they are further away, they will respond slower. So, by looking at how the lines respond, the variability of the lines to the variability of the continuum, one can try and understand and get a handle on how. Uh, far these lines are and not only how far these lines are, but you will find that not all you know lines of different ionizations are located at different distances. Here you can see the top two are the first <coughs> monitoring the line in continuum emission. This is a massive program of a Seifert galaxy NGC 5548. The first two lines show the ultraviolet and optical continuum. You can see that lime and alpha and carbon 4 respond earlier than H beta. So, there is structure within the broad line region as well and you can go and estimate the distances and once you estimate the distances and the velocities, you can go back and get a mass for the black hole and in this particular case, it is about 65 million solar masses or so. So, this is a broad canonical model of an active galactic nucleus where we have a supermassive black hole with an accretion disk surrounded by a torus and the manifestations of it across the wavelength as well infrared wavelengths we should be able to find evidences of the torus. So, it has not been possible to touch on every aspect of it, but just to give you pointers to one point is to where the field is currently is. Now, we talked about accretion into a black hole. So, one of the earlier attempts at accretion at trying to verify this scenario was to see whether we can find gas which is falling in because after all you got to feed the black hole. If, if the black hole exists on its own without being fed, there is nothing very interesting that you are going to see. So, one of the very early experiments was done by a lady called Jacqueline Van Corkum who did, who made H1 observations of uh, absorption observations towards the cores of radio galaxies. And in her observation, she sort of in her sample, she found that there was a preponderance of red shifted atomic hydrogen, which means they are falling into the nucleus. And so, we thought, hey, we found a gas which is fueling this. But, of, but more recent observations over the last couple of decades have shown that the H1 dynamics is far more complicated that you have gas which may be rotating, you may be gas which is infalling, you may also have gas which are being pushed out by the jets. So, there is evidence of that which Rafaela Morganti and others at Westerbork have shown very clearly in several of these objects that there are very shallow absorption troughs which could go up to thousands of kilometers per second. So, this is a project which also we have been sort of uh, doing at the, with the GMRT. I will just close by showing you two of these slides over here. And, and this one is a rejuvenated radio galaxy. We try to ask ourselves that when rejuvenated radio galaxies, a new pair of galaxies, a new pair of lobes are born, is it due to a fresh supply of gas which one might find evidence of? 
So we do find that there is a higher incidence of H1 absorption if you look at these rejuvenated radio sources. So it is perhaps playing a role, but whether that is a whole story is something we do not know. Here the radio contours show the large scale structure. This is one which is over a megaparsec, about a megaparsec in size and the inset shows the, the small scale parsec scale structures and you can see the absorption lines which have been detected with the GMRT. This was done by Yogesh Chandola. So I will show you another image over here which was also done, uh, which is also part, the slides are from Yogesh and this was an object called 4C 29.30 where it is not an FR2 source, you can see diffused lobes of emission and you can see an inner double and outer older emission over there. And here again, there is evidence of H1, rich H1 gas with very complex line, line profiles showing that gas is, uh, th there is abundance of gas in the central regions which are fueling these radio sources. So, I think I will end with that as you can see that the whole studies of AGN, there are a lot of still challenging questions to answer and ask right, right from what is it that, uh, that triggers the kind of AGN activity because we know today that all uh, galaxies with a bulge have a black hole in them. But just having a black hole is not adequate to generate the kind of activities which we see. How do the AGN population change with cosmic epoch? What is the interrelationship between the AGN activity and starburst activity, which we met in the last in the in the in the previous lecture? How do these change with cosmic epoch? How are jets actually generated? The whole detailed physics of it, and so there there are there are a lot of interesting questions related to it, and I hope uh, these couple of lectures will lead give you pointers to try and look further into this.